All right, we so far have several ways of calculating the delta H of a reaction. One of the ways was Hess's law. Another of the ways was using enthalpies of formation. And another way is by using what we call bond enthalpies. And that means enthalpies of reaction. And what that is based on is tabulated data for breaking bonds. So in any given reaction that takes place, you're going to break bonds and you're going to make bonds. Now, in the case of this particular reaction that uh, I have on the PowerPoint slides, we're actually going to take a look at this compound and we're going to see that the carbon-hydrogen bond, which exists on the reactant side, doesn't exist on the product side. So let's just do a simple demonstration. Here's the pin. And if I'm looking at the pen, it's bound together. It's whole, the molecules of the pen are held together by bonds. If I break the pen, I'm going to have to put in energy to do that. And that's going to be true of every bond in every molecule. Energy is required to break those bonds. So here I'm going to break a carbon-hydrogen uh, bond. And if I have to put energy in, that's an endothermic process. So endothermic has a positive delta H. The chlorine-chlorine bond also has to be broken because I don't see it over here on the product side. That's how you tell what bond you're breaking and what bond you're making. I don't see a carbon-hydrogen bond on the product side, but I have one on the reactant side. That must mean I broke this bond. Same thing for the chlorine-chlorine bond. I have it on the reactant side. I don't see it on the product side. So I must have broken this bond. One of the simplest things that I like to do in indicating that I'm breaking a bond so I keep track of it is I just draw a line through the bonds that I'm breaking. The bonds that I'm making and I, I have a carbon-chlorine bond on the product side. I don't have it on the reactant side. I put a little circle around there to indicate that I'm making that bond. And if I'm making a bond, energy is going to be released, and so delta H is going to be negative. I'm also making a hydrogen-chlorine bond. How did I tell I'm making that bond? Because it's not, it doesn't exist over here on the reactant side. So I have two bonds that I've broken and two bonds that I've made. So I have delta H positive over here on the reactant side, and that's always going to be the case. And I have a negative delta H on the product side because energy is going to be released. That's why atoms bind together, because that it stabilizes them when they bind together. They release energy. They go from a higher energy as separate atoms to a lower energy as a molecule. So when atoms get together and form bonds, they release energy. All right, so that's the general idea. So if we take a look at that, two bonds are broken, two bonds are formed. All we have to do is add those two values together. Okay, so we're going to break we're going to break a carbon-hydrogen bond, a chlorine-chlorine bond. We're going to make a carbon-chlorine bond and a hydrogen-chlorine bond. So you'll be given tabulated data for the test. And when you look, okay, so I'm breaking right here. So that's going to be a positive delta H of 413. I'm also breaking a chlorine-chlorine bond. I've got to go find that. Here it is right here. I'm breaking a chlorine-chlorine bond. That's going to be a positive 242. And this is in kilojoules per mole. So what you need to remember is if I had, for instance, two carbon-hydrogen bonds that I was breaking, I would need to multiply, in this case, the 413 by 2. It's not the case in this particular problem, but if I had two molecules or two bonds of carbon-hydrogen that were breaking, I would multiply 413 by 2. And that's a positive 413 because I'm breaking those bonds. All right, so what am I making? Well, I'm making a carbon-chlorine bond, so I've got to go find 
carbon chlorine. Here it is. I'm making that bond. That's going to be a negative 328. And if it were two, and it is also in kilojoules per mole, if it were two of them, it's not in this problem, but if it were, I would have to multiply that negative 328 by 2. All right? In this case, it's just fine, okay, the way that it is with just one of them. And then the other thing I'm making is a hydrogen chlorine bond. So I've got to go find my hydrogen chlorine bond, and there it is. Finally, I found it. And so since that bond is being formed, that's going to be a negative 431. All right, so now that we know what we're making, what we're breaking, we put it all together. And we put it all together in this solution. Two bonds are being broken. That's a positive delta H. Uh, there's 413 for the carbon hydrogen and 242 for a positive for the chlorine chlorine. Two bonds are being formed. That's a negative delta H, carbon chlorine, hydrogen chlorine, and 431. And it's just bonds broken plus bonds formed. And you get a minus 104 kilojoules for the solution. So I'll give you a problem on the test. You may have to draw the Lewis structures. In this case, I drew them for you. But uh, you may have to draw the Lewis structures in order to complete the problem. I promise it will not be a difficult set of Lewis structures. But as I said, you may have to uh, do it yourself. All right. So this is 413 plus 242 plus a minus 328 plus a minus 431. Don't forget that if you have more than one of a particular type of bond that you are either breaking or making, you have to multiply by the coefficient that describes that particular bond. All right, bond lengths, we went through that. Triple bonds are shorter than double bonds, uh, which are shorter than single bonds. So single bonds are longer and weaker than double bonds, which are longer and weaker than triple bonds. All right, let's take a look at a quick summary. Um, single bonds are longer and weaker than double bonds, which are longer and weaker than triple bonds. But the fact of the matter is they are not, so a double bond isn't half the length and twice the strength, bond strength, of a single bond, and a triple bond isn't three times shorter or one-third the length and three times as strong as a single bond. And that's because we have different types of bonding, and we'll be talking about that. Bond comparisons. Are all single bonds equivalent? The answer to that is no. So here we have, on one end of the spectrum, what we call a nonpolar covalent bond. If you have two atoms that are exactly the same, and they're non-metals, as is hydrogen. It would be the same for uh, Cl2, Br2, I2, O2, N2. Those are non-polar covalent bonds. So I'm going to write up here. This is completely non-polar covalent bond. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. For completely ionic bonds, this would be something like cesium fluoride. Now, this is completely ionic. You've got a metal, cesium ion. It's got a plus one charge. You've got a fluoride ion. It's got a full-on negative charge. Fluorine is what we call the most electronegative element on the periodic table. It's clinging to that extra electron that it stole from cesium. And you might remember that cesium metal doesn't exist on the planet as a metal. It only exists as a plus one cation in these types of ionic compounds. So this is a completely ionic bond. Now, here's the deal. Ionic bonds are, by definition, polar bonds. They are not, however, covalent bonds. They are ionic. They are composed of ions.
So these two bonds, completely ionic and nonpolar covalent, are at opposite ends of the bonding spectrum. Everything else that isn't diatomic, where the same element is bound to itself and it's a non-metal, or completely ionic, something like cesium fluoride, a metal and a non-metal, everything else is somewhere in between in terms of single bond character. We can say that any bond that isn't nonpolar covalent has some ionic character, and we can say that any bond that's less polar than, oh, something like cesium fluoride has a little bit of covalent character. And so that there's a spectrum of polarity for these bonds. So HCl is a great example of this. The bond between hydrogen and chlorine is indeed quite polar. This has a partial negative charge because chlorine wants the electrons in this bond more than hydrogen is. And that leaves an electron deficit for hydrogen in terms of the density uh, of the electrons that are in this bond sticking with hydrogen. And you might notice that when you put hydrogen chloride, when you bubble it into water, it behaves just like an ionic compound that's soluble in water. The electrons snap on to the chlorine atom and they form H plus and the chloride anion, which we call hydrochloric acid. Types of covalent bonds. You've got nonpolar covalent bonds where electrons are shared equally between two atoms. These are gonna be molecules like H two and N2 and O2, F2 and Cl2 and Br2 and I2. All these, all these diatomic molecules have nonpolar covalent bonds. But the moment that you have any two atoms that are both nonmetals, but they're not the same atom, you have an unequal sharing. So for instance, if I just have, let's say, uh, an OH bond, and we'll make this water. So here's your water molecule. This bond between hydrogen and oxygen, these are both nonmetals but the bond between them is extraordinarily polar, and we would call this a polar covalent bond. And that's because you have an unequal sharing of the electrons in the bond between hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen is definitely the more electronegative. Hydrogen is less electronegative. And so you have this this separation of charge, which is what makes it a polar bond, and the, what makes it a covalent bond is that oxygen is a non-metal and hydrogen is a non-metal. Right, here is a chart for electronegativity. You can see that hydrogen is at 2.1. Fluorine is the queen of electronegativity at four on the Pauling scale. And so once again, the periodic properties look similar to what you've seen before. We have really low electronegativity down here for cesium and really high electronegativity on fluorine. And so you can look at it with this kind of increase in electronegativity. This is high electronegativity, EN, and this is low electronegativity, EN, okay? So just look at the trends, learn the trends, and you should be good to go. Electronegativity by definition is the ability of an atom and a molecule to attract electrons to itself. So there, there are two ways we can describe it. Uh, we use this uh, little 
uh, delta signal, lowercase, or lowercase positive, lowercase negative, or the alternative way is to draw an arrow with the positive end with the cross and the pointy end. This is pointing to the negative side. This is pointing to the positive side. These are both very polar covalent bonds. When two atoms are identical, the electrons are shared equally. This is a non-polar bond. When two atoms are different, the atoms are shared unequally in the bond, and we call it a polar bond. All right? Remember the difference between an ionic bond and a covalent bond. So which of the following is the most po polar covalent bond? So this is a trick question, and when I do it in class, I always catch about 40-50% of the people. It's polar. Now, are ionic compounds polar? Absolutely. Are, are the bonds in ionic compounds polar? Absolutely. So this is the most polar bond that is listed here, but this is an ionic bond. Okay, this is an ionic bond because sodium is a metal and chlorine is a nonmetal. So you would be right to say it's polar, but you would be wrong to say it's covalent. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at fluorine, fluorine. Well, fluorine and fluorine, this is F2. That's nonpolar covalent. And then we have sulfur and fluorine. Here's sulfur and fluorine. Well, that's going to be a polar covalent bond, but phosphorus is further away in electronegativity. We can go back and take a look at the difference between in electronegativity between phosphorus and sulfur. And if we do that, we can see that phosphorus is down here at 2.1. Sulfur is at 2.5. So, so phosphorus is less electronegative than sulfur is. And so the bond between them is more polar covalent than the fluorine sulfur bond.